Hello. Today is Tuesday, October 20th, and this is the 20th chapter of the Acts of the Apostles. In the 20th chapter, it's not even 40 verses long, so it's not as long as some of the other chapters, but there's so much that happens. So it's it's a, it's going to be a lot. So let's get started right away before um, we run out of time. <laughs> Paul leaves Ephesus. So he'd been in Ephesus. And remember that he had uh, sent Timothy and Erastus ahead of him to Macedonia. So he when he leaves Ephesus, he goes to Macedonia and then he goes to Greece where he stays for three months, it says. Um, and then he went to leave for Syria, but discovered a plot against him and decided rather than sail for Syria, he would go through Macedonia. Macedonia. So he takes with him six people who were named and identified in the book there. One of them is Timothy, who we know, and the others are new to us. And uh, those six people uh, and are... are uh, from different places and they're all named and they're all in there. And apparently in verse five, Luke is there too, or some type of narrator because it moves again from the uh, third person to first person plural, as in us and we. And so maybe it's like the seventh person is Luke, but those six people go on ahead uh, to Troas and then the narrator, Luke, we assume it's Luke, and Paul travel to, to be with them uh, later. So they're in, they're in Troas, wait, the six of them are in Troas waiting, and uh, Luke, the author, and Paul uh, sailed from Philippi and then met them five days uh, later and then stayed there for seven days with them. And then Paul addresses them from what uh, looks like dinner time to midnight. So he's with the gathered group of believers and he is addressing them. And this is what happens, a preacher's worst nightmare. There's a boy, a young man named Eutychus. I'm going to attempt his name that way. While Paul was talking, you know, from like dinner time to midnight, this young man fell asleep and he was sitting near the window and apparently he fell asleep, fell out the window three stories to his death because Paul was droning on for hours. That's why it's the preacher's worst nightmare. So the boy falls down to the ground to his death three stories and it looks as if Paul brings him back to life. But what he does is was Paul comes down the stairs, grabs him, holds him and says, you know, there's still life in him. And then assume, assume, assuming he puts him back down and goes right back up the stairs and eats something, and then he can carry on until dawn with his speaking. And then everyone else fell asleep and fell out the window and died. No, just kidding. Just the one kid. But uh, so he's, he goes back up and gets something to eat and carries on. And then we assume that um, this little this boy, this person lived, and um, that's a similar to... Um, both Jesus raising Lazarus in the Gospels and Peter um, having raised a man from the dead in uh, earlier in Acts. So we have everybody gets their dead raising time. Ta-da! <laughs> but I would say that Paul and Eutychus uh, need to be called even because you could, could you could conceive that Paul's droning on and on for hours upon hours caused him to fall asleep and fall out the window. So that's, I mean, it sort of like looks that, that way, the way Acts tells the story. So they're Ethan Stevens. That's terrible. Um, but so then he, but he saves his life. So then they leave for ASOS. Uh, we're still in the first person. We leave for ASOS. Uh, okay. And so they go to all these other places. They identify them all. They're all listed there. And Paul wants to be, and at the very end, it says that Paul wants to be in Jerusalem for Pentecost. He's still an observant Jew, which is interesting because you kind of see him all the time in the temple saying, I'm only going to go to the Gentiles. He does that declaration three times in, in the book of Acts. We haven't seen them all three yet, but he's only, I'm, I'm going to the Gentiles. I'm going to the Gentiles. I promise. But he keeps returning to the synagogue, you know. We sort of do that, don't we? We return to the places we know best. Um, Paul's farewell speech then. Here in, in 20, we got eight more chapters, but 
in 20, um, he is doing a farewell speech. And this is, Paul, this, this is different from other speeches in that it's not an apologetic speech. It is a speech to the faithful. It is a speech to the people that he has planted in these pla in this place in, in in this place, it, which is um, in Ephesus. No, not in Ephesus. Where is he when he makes this speech? Yes, Ephesian elders. He's in Ephesus. That's what I thought. Um, so he this, but this speech is really really important. So do you want to take a look at it? Uh, you want to look at verse eighteen b, like the second half of. Uh, verse 18, and it carries on to um, 35. So 18 to 35 roughly is, or 19 to 35 roughly, is the content of this beautiful speech. Like I said, it's different. It's different in its tone and emphasis because the audience is completely different. He's talking to the faithful. It is his farewell speech. So he's there with them in... Um, Ephesus. He sends for them. They come to him. And it's the, I guess it's the elders. So it's the like leaders of the groups that he has started in Ephesus. And uh, this just, it's so Paul. When you read it, you hear the language that he uses in the epistles as well. So you can just see Paul saying this because you, if you've studied, in which, which I have studied Philippians and Galatians and Ephesians, uh, more so than I've even studied Acts, you can hear the similarities in the way uh, Paul talks, and uh, it's just there's just a, a a a way of him speaking. And um, what would be interesting for me is because I studied the Greek in Philippians and Galatians, uh, it would be interesting for me to look at how the Greek is written by Luke in Acts, quoting Paul. Because this, the language, the way he talks is so similar to what he says. And here's a couple of the verses that I wanted to point out. He says, but I do not count my life of any value to myself. If only I may finish my course and the ministry that I have received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the good news of God's grace. And so that is like um, Philippians chapter three, um, for me to live as Christ, to die is gain. Same theology there. Also you have, um, uh, finish the race, finish the course. That's in another one of the epistles where he talks about it being, um, a race, uh, finish, finishing the race. And then, um, there's another part and this. Now I'm reading from verse 32. And now I commend you to God and to the message of his grace, a message that is able to build you up, to give you the inheritance among all who are sanctified. And here he is talking about inheritance, and you know there's a whole big section in, um, I can't really think of which epistle it is right now, but about Abraham and the inheritance and how we, you know, we inherit this and the recapitulation of Jesus on the head of Adam. There's all these like theological themes that are here in this, in this farewell speech of Paul's because Paul is heading towards Jerusalem and Jerusalem is where, spoiler alert, he gets arrested. So he says to them, even there, he says, you will not see my face again. Um, know that none of you among you whom I have gone about proclaiming the, God, the kingdom will ever see my face again. So that's harsh for them to hear because he's saying like, you won't, I'm not coming back. I know the spirit is leading me down this, this road and this is the destination here. And, and he knows about it. And he says that it is and, and he quote he says he's quoting the Lord Jesus, but we don't find it in anywhere specifically like this in the Gospels. It is more blessed to give than to receive. He says that at the end of his speech, that's how he finishes speaking in Acts, in this record. Um, when he finishes preaching to them and saying goodbye to them, they all like huddle up in a prayer hug, kneeling, weeping, um, saying goodbye in a physical way to, to kind of seal that uh, relationship there. It's very beautiful because you get to see that, you know, you talk about the acts community that's created there in the way you get to see that bonding, that closeness, um, what's most important. And what's most important is the grace of God and that message being shared with people so that they can come into communities like this. Uh, other things are not as important. And he lists them here. He says, um, I do not... Um, 
I do not seek your gold or your, um, it's right after the sanctified. I, I covet no one's silver or gold or clothing. You know for yourselves, I worked with my own hands to support myself and my companions. So that's what he did with Aquila. He was building tents. So this is Paul. He is a the ultimate example of a missionary. But he's funding himself with his the labor of his hands. I think it's something to think about. As controversial as me, a preacher who's paid by the church to do the church job, um, to say that, that uh, the model for this kind of overseer and leader is not necessarily a person who is supported by the faithful, but everybody pitching in and uh, helping out and doing an, doing a job that is external to the uh, church formation. And... The idea is that there, there are different jobs that are listed in this book of Acts. Uh, tent making is Paul's. Um, and we have Lydia, the seller of purple cloth. And we have, remember those guys who made the idols? So there's jobs that become obsolete because of the gospel. And then there's jobs that are necessary to support the ministry of the gospel. And so this picture that we get of society and how it ought to work through the book of Acts is really, really in tension with not only the society we live in and the values we hold about um, uh, being uh, self-sufficient and um, not being interdependent on one another, that part of not communal against communal living. We have our own private property. We have our own, you know, security and our places that we dwell in and um, privacy, that kind of thing. So that's not what they're formulating there. And also this idea that we have a church that's a structure that has a building somewhere in one location uh, that is not mobile, like a tent possibly would be, and um, that is uh, requires us to support it and give money to it and make sure that it's, you know, there's nothing in here about 20, 20, 20 ton air conditioners in the gospel of Acts. So, you know, and we have all these trappings, but the question that this, when I'm praying about this chapter 2020 20, is where are we now? What, where could, what can we learn from this about the way we do church in today's day and age and how are people um, reaching, being reached with the message of God's grace, which is still the point today that it was then. But uh, what, are, what, are, what are the things that are getting in the way of that? And I think that some of our structures and our institutions are what's getting in the way of that. And the only way for us to realize that is that they are starting to be less supported by the generations that come uh, after the next and after the next and after the next and less trusted and um, when this corruption happens within the church structures, there, there's that that happens. Uh, there's a lot of mistrust of that institution as an institution. But the gospel message, the message of God's grace, this is the point that Paul's trying to make 20 in this farewell speech, is still the primary point. It's the primary point. It's not about Paul or what he has or what he's able to gain. In fact, Paul's willing to give up his life and his um, freedom to get the message out. And uh, I'm sure that physically he was getting tired of traveling from place to place to place to place to place, uh, spreading the message, and then returning to those places to encourage the believers and make these kind of speeches and speak into the evening and make people fall asleep and fall out windows. Um, there's a lot he's doing to get the gospel out. And of course, that's why we have this today, because of what he did back then. But I don't believe that that's a vacuum. I don't believe that's a one-time thing. I believe that God still inspires us. The Holy Spirit still works within us to move us out into places new and bold. And so we need to ask the next question, maybe, about how we do ministry in the world. So Acts 20, submitted for your approval. Read it yourself, uh, this section, this farewell speech, and see what emerges for you. God bless you.